Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, and welcome back to New Books and National Security, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm John Sacalariatis, the host of the channel. On the show today, we are pleased to have Dr. Matthew Brazil and Peter Mattis. Matthew is an analyst at Blue Path Labs and a fellow at the Jamestown Foundation. He has a background as a U.S. diplomat, soldier, and corporate security investigator. Peter Mattis was a fellow at the Jamestown Foundation when he wrote this book. He has worked on a range of China-related issues from traditional security issues to human rights in the U.S. government and think tanks. Most notably, he began his career as a counterintelligence analyst at the Central Intelligence Agency and most recently served in government as a Senate-appointed staff director at the Congressional Executive Commission on China. Peter will be speaking in a personal capacity today. We'll be talking to Peter and Matthew about their new book, Chinese Communist Espionage and Intelligence Primer. Peter, Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Thank you for having us, John. You two have put together a fascinating book that explains the individuals, the institutions, the ideology, and the politics that have shaped China's intelligence services over time. Can you start by telling us what motivated you to write the book? Well, for my part, I think it's that there was so little out there that was sort of the, just the facts, bare bone introduction to China's intelligence services, how they how they conducted their operations, their history, and that this kind of format allowed a way for us to present a lot of information really quickly. And so that if someone was a corporate investigator or a counterintelligence analyst in government, that they'd have something that they could you know, s- turn the pages quite quickly to find, oh, what is, you know, what, what have they done in the past with different cases? Um, or to understand some of the figures that are a part of shaping this history and the tradition, right? In the United States, we know about Wild Bill Donovan. We know about the impact of, of Bill Colby, of, of different directors over time. In the same thing in, in the Russian system because of the rich literature that's already already there. But you know, how many people are aware of Joe and Lai's intelligence role? How many people are aware of of the role of people like um, Li Kunol or some of the other heroes of the revolution in the intelligence world? And this seemed like the easiest way to present that information quickly, even if it isn't the most elegant narrative form. Yeah, another point, too, is that there tends to be a lot of hyperbole out there about this topic, which segues well into the fact that it's a different uh, group of people, ethnic group of people who are doing it, um, along with our sordid history of not dealing well with different ethnic groups of people. So another thing that I think uh, is important about a book like this and other things that we write uh, elsewhere is we want to reduce the panic. Um, this is this is important stuff. You know, it's it's a threat to national security, but it's spying. It's not an attack on the World Trade Center. And there are things you can do to respond to spying. You can increase your counter espionage effort, for example, uh, which which is being done, I suppose, to a degree. But we have to treat this like any other national security problem, focus on it and solve it. The introduction to the book starts in 2011 with a brutal scene where two Chinese government officials, one of whom whom is pregnant, are killed before an audience of fellow officials. Why start the book there? What does that vignette tell us about espionage and counterespionage in China? Well, one of the things that that little vignette tells us, because there's there are a lot of stories like this floating out around the period of late 2010, 2011, 2012, when when the Ministry of State Security reportedly wrapped up a rather large collection of spies that were reportedly working for the United States, and it's not they didn't imprison these people to exchange them for their for their assets who have been arrested overseas. They weren't looking for a, a trade or a bargain. It's a it's a zero sum game in some sense to the Ministry of State Security, and 
they are a service that has come out of struggle, that has a revolutionary heritage, and views itself as, as the guardian of that, of that legacy within the party, or at least one of the guardians. And I think we need to be clear that, that this is a set of intelligence services that are quite aggressive, that view the world in, in particularly Manichaean terms, and they are, they are going to secure the state as best they can, as aggressively as they can, using, using all of the, the means at their disposal. I wanted to set, oh, sorry, Peter, were you about to jump in? <laughs> well, I think, um, yeah, I think that another thing to keep in mind here is that this is a Leninist regime. When there were mass demonstrations um, in Tiananmen Square and elsewhere in 1989, and for that matter, when there are um, uh, signs of unrest in Shanghai today because of the lockdown, I think the, the regime pays attention to public opinion, but it doesn't sit back and think, oh my goodness, what have we been doing wrong? We need to change some of our policies. Um, that's not them at all. Their thing is rule by the Leninist elite. And they view their society as being full of enemies. And that was true back during the revolution. It was true right after 19, the 1949 victory when they purged millions of people uh, who had been associated with the previous regime. Uh, and it's true today. So that is one aspect of, of uh, this system and of this particular body in the system that is important to understand. And let me clarify for our listeners, that was actually Matt who just spoke, if I generated some confusion there. Before we dive deeper into this conversation, I think we should break down what we are talking about when we talk about Chinese espionage. So what are the institutions that comprise China's intelligence services and what aspect of intelligence is each of them responsible for? That's a that's a good question, John. And this this confusion over what constitutes Chinese intelligence or Chinese espionage is one that we use as a kind of a measuring stick for what we chose to include in the book, because there are lots of other cases. There are lots of other actors doing things for commercial gain um, or who are operating at the seams of, you know, private entrepreneurship and criminality and benefiting the party state. And, we wanted to make sure that when we were looking at this, when we use Chinese intelligence, that we were using Chinese intelligence in the same way that we would understand it if someone said American intelligence or Russian intelligence, right? That these are the formal institutions of the party state for conducting this work. And so the, the most important ones are the Ministry of State Security, which is a bit like the old KGB, except it doesn't have armed border guards, um, but it is responsible for foreign intelligence and internal security and internal counterintelligence. Um, the second big intelligence system is within the People's Liberation Army under the, under the Joint Staff Department, which is, includes an intelligence bureau. And this is where the defense attaches, clandestine defense human um, as well as some analytic capabilities are, are embedded. There's also the strategic support force inside the PLA, which is where sort of the national signals intelligence, electronic intelligence collection comes from. And there's also a, there's also a ministry of public security, which is essentially a national police force, but it also has domestic security um, responsibilities and sometimes is involved in counterintelligence, even though ostensibly that role was given to the Ministry of State Security when that ministry was created in 1983. And connected to all of this is a united front system within the party. And this united front system maintains a network of I don't know, front organizations. Uh, what inside China are called mass organizations, you know, fake civil society organizations, and they're responsible for monitoring overseas Chinese communities, mobilizing people in support of the party state. 
And, you know, it's, it's in one sense, you could think of it like a mass system for networking on a, on a global, on an, on an internal China scale and on a global scale. And you can see why the intelligence agencies would have connections to the system, um, sometimes be a part of the system and sometimes be ex exploiting the system for their own, for their own purposes. Relative to other organs of the party and the state in China, just how influential are these formal intelligence organs? I think this is one of those questions that has varied over time. You know, in, in some cases, the, the intelligence services are very directly connected to particular members of the CCP elite, and their, their power and influence reflects those individuals. In other cases, they're, you know, for example, with the creation of the Ministry of State Security, it seemed like the party leadership wanted to ensure that the ministry was not politically powerful, but was just performing the functions of an intelligence service to inform the leadership and not playing a role in where it was, was picking fights or a part of the fights among the elite. And that the party itself had, had created a, I hate to call it a norm because the Leninist system doesn't really have political norms, but a kind of agreement in the 1980s and 1990s that we don't really want to let any one political faction have its way with the Ministry of State Security to turn these tools on, on each other again, right? Because this is part of the historical legacy that the Ministry of State Security came out of. I think Matt's probably the best to talk about how that how the intelligence services have, pl have played that role. But I think in a, in a real sense, the MSS and the other intelligence services are quite powerful in terms of the man on the street, but may not have the same kind of political power, um, you know, in the, in the elite circles that the KGB might have had in, in its heyday. Yeah, I think that's certainly true. And if we go back there, there was a, time when when the intelligence services in the party during the revolution had something resembling KGB purge type power and that was in the early 1940s <clears throat> from approximately I, I would I would say it was uh, 1942 to 1944 and that was temporary and it was viewed as in in retrospect as a mistake um, it, it may be that uh, Mao Zedong viewed his use of the security services during that time, which he apologized to the party for, basically, um, as, as an error. It shouldn't be repeated that uh, if you want to terrorize a bunch of people, you use the so-called mass line that is mobilizing um, people to uh, act in, in a group against an individual who, whom you're setting up as an example. Um, for the most part, the, the party uh, has used the intelligence services for that function and sometimes to, to do some investigations uh, uh, of parts of itself, but they've kept it out of that KGB type role for the most part. We've been talking a little bit around the issue of ideology and the book is of course, communist intelligence. It has an important adjective in front of intelligence. Um, there is a tendency sometimes in the West to view modern China as communist only in name. So I want to ask, what role does communism or communist ideology play in the production and consumption of intelligence in China? I think the, the biggest piece that would stand out in my mind is that the Chinese Communist Party has defined security in terms of the absence of threat, that that the abs that the party and China can only be secure if there is an absence of threat to the party's ability to govern, as it was framed in the in the recent national security law a few years ago. And when you think about that absence of threat, right? This you know you can't prove a negative, and so it creates, I think, an impetus and a push for the party and the, therefore the Ministry of State Security and the other intelligence organs to be looking out for threats in a very aggressive way and to constantly be in search of those enemies as, as Matt described it. 
right? They, they divide the world into essentially friends, neutrals, and enemies. And they're always going to be out there searching and poking and assuming that those enemies are there coming at, coming at the party state. So in some sense, the Ministry of State Security and the other intelligence organs are not always thinking about intelligence as information to inform the leadership as it's thinking about foreign policy decisions. They're thinking about how do we inform the leadership so it can make security decisions to protect the party state. And that that is the the foremost priority of, of, of these intelligence services. Yeah, and like dictators everywhere. <clears throat> Sorry to, to, to besmirch other dictators. Like dictators everywhere, um, they presume that if there's opposition inside of their system, that someone outside must be um, fomenting it. They, uh, they tend to have less of a belief that their own people have agency uh, when it comes to uh, significant disagreement with central policy. Um, which we've seen in our own history in the South during the civil rights movement. People presumed that, uh, that uh, it was Northern activists that were stirring everything up when the case was that there was simply large scale uh, dissatisfaction. Have you kind of investigated the question of, you know, to what extent are staying on the communist ideology theme what percentage of the influence is kind of driven by genuine conviction and what percentage is driven by either producers or consumers of intelligence um, kind of trying to please their bureaucratic masters and shape things around, um, you know, a communist mindset that they assume to be there or assume to be something that will help differentiate them if they want to move up in the bureaucracy, let's say. I think we could expect that something like that took place, but we don't really have good insight. I mean, one of the one of the tragedies of the way in which um, Chinese intelligence sources have been handled in the West is that they they haven't been paired with academics or journalists the way Russian defectors or spies were to tell the stories and to tell the history, and so we don't have that kind of fidelity out in the public realm about how those decisions work. I think you know, we, can, we can make a few kind of tentative judgments or maybe put them up more as questions to be, or ideas to be tested than, than conclusions. But one of the interesting things when people who are journalists and think tanks and freelance researchers get pitched by the Ministry of State Security or by, by military intelligence, they're often being asked to collect information in, in the form of, of more analytic reports. You know, talk to your talk to your friends at the State Department or on Capitol Hill or you know, wherever, and come back to us with, you know, with an answer to an analytic question. And I think when you when you look at a at a communist system where ideological rule plays a role in in what can be said, how it can be said that the Ministry of State Security, that the PLA intelligence services use this approach is a way of distancing themselves from the analysis, right? They can kind of pass it up to the leadership and say, don't shoot the messenger. It's not our assessment. It's the assessment of our, of our sources. And it's kind of a way to, to skirt some of those ideological problems. And the second point about this is that in a conversation with a few foreign intelligence officers who had, who had retired that I've met over the years, there was a comment that the MSS did not really do analysis the way that the British system does with the Joint Intelligence Committee, the way CIA and DIA and State Department's Intelligence and Research Bureau do analysis, that it was not a formal process that regularly pitched these analytic products up, but rather it was somebody who was connected to the vice ministers or the minister who was trusted to have a, you know, to write the, to write the report and to have an, an analysis and to put it in the proper context so that it could be distributed under that senior person's name up to the leadership 
And you know, so it's something that would be kept within a very narrow circle. Yeah, and one problem with that is that it um, cancels out the possibility that um, that an institution like MSS yeah. would be able to uh, tell, to, to use an overused phrase, um, speak truth to power uh, in the same way that is done in, in other countries. Um, this personalization of, uh, of uh, passing along intelligence that Peter just described makes it, I think, even riskier for that vice minister or someone else to tell people at the top things they'd rather not hear. Peter, you alluded to um, either in your prior answer or an earlier one, um, the kind of asymmetry and knowledge that the average Westerner has about, say, the Russian intelligence services and the Chinese intelligence services. And in this conversation we're having about intelligence, I completely blew over sources and methods. So where do you get the information that you use for the book is one part of the question. The second part, uh, which is maybe related, maybe not, is is there a good reason why the average Westerner knows so much less about China as opposed to Russia? I mean, sure, assuredly, it has to do at least in some part with just how much you know great literature there is about there, about the KGB and whatnot. But uh, I would love to hear if you think there's kind of a better explanation why perhaps a language barrier that um, creates that um, gap in understanding. Look, I think Matt and I would both wholeheartedly agree that the language barrier is an issue, that some of the misconceptions that are out there about Chinese intelligence come from the fact that many people have not actually read what, what they say about themselves or how you know, military thinkers think about the intelligence problem or how some of their systems have been designed. And, you know, that, that was really the core part of a lot of our work was digging through Chinese books, through memoirs. Um, I think Matt even was going through Joe and Lai's TikTok um, kind of diary. Not, not the, not the TikTok of ByteDance, but the, you know, the TikTok of his, of his daily routine and finding interesting thing, interesting nuggets in, in those places. You know, this also meant looking through, sort of sorting through the Chinese internet, looking for articles, looking for some of the histories that were published, uh, picking up books, you know, on, that we'd collected over different trips to the PRC, you know, even before we'd even thought of this as a project. And yeah, I, it wouldn't be possible without the language. And I think that that's really the biggest reason why there's there's an asymmetry is that it's not an accessible, it's not an accessible subject if you don't have the language. And because there hasn't been the same effort that was made with the Soviets and then, and then later Russian sources to tell the histories and to tell the stories, right? These, you know, we don't even have a sense of the operational legends or myths, if you will, that the party uses to inspire itself or that the Ministry of State Security uses to inspire itself. Yeah, another problem too, <clears throat> pardon me, is that um, is the golden rule. Those who have the gold make the rules. And in our society, um, until recently, uh, I would say the, the business community um, didn't know because they didn't want to know. They, they were engaged in, <clears throat> in marvelous quarterly profits uh, year after year in China. And, uh, and according to the latest uh, U.S.-China Business Council um, poll, I think it's 87% of U.S. businesses are still making money that are in China, are still making money in China. But, um, but uh, having worked most of my career in the business community, I think I can say with confidence that during the uh, 90s and the noughts uh, and into the teens, um, the U.S. business community and uh, the politicians who are their friends uh, preferred to sweep problems under the rug and and uh, uh, view China with optimism. Let's 
take a stab at bridging the gap in that asymmetry. In this book, you profile some of the most important figures in the history of China's intelligence services. If you had to choose one or two whose stories best capture the essence of espionage in China, who would they be and why? Well, in the early days, um, a lot of people would pick this figure called Kang Sheng, K-A-N-G-S-H-E-N-G. And we have to mention him because he was uh, uh, a brilliant organizer. He's the one who took CCP intelligence in the uh, beginning in the late 30s and into the 40s and and uh, reorganized it so that it worked better and indeed was a very important tool uh, during the Civil War beginning in 1946-47 that ended in the 1949 victory. However, um, for these purposes, I would pick two other people. Uh, one is Li Kanong that, that uh, Peter mentioned earlier. So Li Kanong was uh, one of the earliest successful spies in the first really effective spy ring that the communists had in uh, the late 1920s, ending in 1931. And he, uh, to make a long story short, he rose through the ranks. He was Kang Sheng's deputy uh, during the darkest period in 1943 uh, of uh, KGB type operations. And then later on, he became the leader of uh, of the Chinese intelligence uh, community during the 1950s. Um, and he, uh, he died in uh, 1962 and was actually uh, down for several years before that with a stroke. And then beyond him, there's another figure that's interesting that also rose up through the ranks um, named Luo Ching Chang, L-U-O-Q-I-N-G-C-H-A-N-G, Luo Ching Chang. Luo Ching Chang was this, uh, is lauded today as a brilliant analyst who knew everything about the enemy uh, during this, during the uh, revolution, during the Yan'an period in the 30s, 40s. Uh, he eventually became a deputy uh, to Kong Yuan, another interesting figure, um, and became aligned with the Cultural Revolution left and became head of CCP intelligence during that period. And interestingly, it took Deng Xiaoping uh, a good four years to push him out. And today, and he, he only left in 1983 when he was uh, bureaucratically retired, when the Ministry of State Security was founded. And even today, you go on the web and you can find all sorts of marvelous things about what a great guy he was um, in the Chinese web space, which is interesting because it indicates that, uh, at least to my conspiratorial mind, that the left is still very effective or very influential in Chinese politics. That is the hardcore left, um, in particular in the intelligence community, perhaps maybe also in the military. Um, a lot of speculation there. But these are these are the interesting figures that come to my mind. So. I think one of my favorites, um, since we focused on the civilian side a little more than the military, would be to would be to pick up the story of Wu Xiaotuan, who was one of the the CCP cadres who was sent off to Moscow, learned Russian, um, became a translator, and came back. And during the long march, he was the translator for Otto Brown, and. In the middle, he was having to translate for Otto Brown when, when Brown and Mao Zedong were fighting. And this is as Mao is steadily consolidating control, isolating his enemies, uh, and, and really putting his stamp on the party. And Wu recognized what a precarious position he was having to say and tra- translate and say all of the nasty things that Otto Brown was saying to Mao. And he approached another figure who's not in the intelligence community, but is probably China's eminent Greece. The, I'm not sure if there's a good equivalent, maybe a Clark Clifford kind of figure in the, in the Chinese system. Yeah, but he was leading some of the military intelligence and sort of staff work at the time. 
And Wu approached Yan and said, look, if I have to keep translating for Brown, Mao's going to kill me. And, and yeah, as he did in a number of different occasions for people like Deng Xiaoping and Hu Yaobang and other names that we would recognize, he sort of looked at Wu and said, well, you might be useful to the party, so let me find a place for you. And Wu um, basically took over the operational intelligence role for the Red Army when they, when they arrived in Yan'an. So if you're thinking about, you know, the big board where enemy units are placed and people can visualize what the map is and where, you know, where the CCP's you know, military units were, where the Guomindong's military units were, where the Japanese were, he was the one who was responsible for building that apparatus, you know, creating the collection requirements for people out in the field to say, look, this is the kind of information we want to have. Here's how to spot it, keeping the order of battle kind of charts of their adversaries. And so he built up that system inside the, the general, you know, what became the general staff department. After the PRC was founded in 1949, he, he went off to Moscow as a senior diplomat and was there for several years. And then he came back and sort of re-entered the PLA and he was sort of brought back into leadership positions in the 1970s by Deng Xiaoping, who had known him sort of back in the day as the deputy chief of general staff for intelligence, a position that he held essentially from 1975 until 1986, I think. And in this process, he modernized military intelligence again. Um, he was one of the people who was dealing with Americans. He was one of the people who saw that their collection apparatus wasn't necessarily doing everything that it needed to. And so he was the, the creator of what is now the, the China Institutes of International and Strategic Studies, which is a PLA affiliated think tank. And it seems like it was explicitly modeled after the U.S. Department of Defense's Office of Net Assessment. You know, how can we bring in data that we don't have? How do we get it on large scales? How do we make sure that we've got a robust knowledge of what the adversary is doing and connecting it to the ways that we understand ourselves. And the relationship that he had with Deng Xiaoping was one of the reasons why, I think, why Deng put his trust in military intelligence and was happy to kind of hamstring the Ministry of State Security in 1985 by telling them that they needed to get out of the embassies and sort of restricting some of their overseas and operational um, footprints. And I think he was able to do this because, or comfortable, was comfortable with doing this because of his relationship with Wu and his trust in the military intelligence system. So this gets to, to Matt's point earlier about personalization of it, um, the issue and the rise and fall of politics, the, the importance of personal networks in the party. And I think also just something that illustrates the long lasting nature of that founding generation in Chinese intelligence, right? Here's someone who was involved in it from the 1930s and he retires in 1986. It's fascinating. As you describe in the book, China's intelligence services have matured pretty significantly over the last 20 years. And a central part of that story is how successfully they adapt to the digital age. Why does China manage that transition, transition excuse me, so effectively when established intelligence powers like the U.S. have gone through so many growing pains recently? Look, I think with respect to the digital age, everyone's gone through growing pains. Um, you know, it's not a, it's not a simple question. <laughs> and it's, and it's, it's something that's quite difficult. Um, but where, where China's intelligence services had a leg up, I think, was that they didn't have all of the legacy equipment um, and infrastructure that was there, right? This is, if you think about what modern signals intelligence and modern close and technical operations look like, the PRC through its autarkic system, the Sino-Soviet split, basically was not out in the world seeing it and experiencing it and collecting it in terms of the industrial age of intelligence. After the 1930s, right, this is where machine encryption became 
the tool of the day. You couldn't pen and paper solve Enigma, Purple, or any of the other sort of top flight codes that any established power was using, whether it was the Soviet Union, um, Imperial Japan, the United States, the UK, et cetera. And you know, I mean, just an interesting note on, on the Long March era is that a lot of, of, P, of Red Army SIGINT was done through document exploitation, not because they had a robust code breaking apparatus, but because they they knew what they were going for, targeted the code books, targeted the communications um, protocols, and incorporated that. And you can actually see how battle performance in the long march changes by virtue of whether or not you think they've got a good SIGINT or a good grasp of the SIGINT target that they're dealing with. But because they were cut off from the from this interplay during the Cold War, they didn't have exposure. They didn't have a bunch of computers. They didn't have a bunch of legacy satellite systems or global listening stations that they needed to figure out what to do with. Um, they didn't have a bureaucracy that needed to be mothballed or, or set aside. And so I think as they witnessed the change that was coming in the 1990s, it was easier for them to invest in building the kind of ecosystem that was both inside the Ministry of State Security, inside the PLA, but also sort of the quasi-governmental organizations um, response, responding to cybersecurity issues. And that in this ecosystem, you have a lot of interchange, a lot of connectivity, and this allowed them to move quite quickly forward. But I think it's, it's a product of not having all of those legacy systems. And because they also have, have I think, done well in terms of thinking about systems themselves, Right? It was easier for them to say, okay, we're starting from scratch. How do we create the system that will bring these capabilities to the fore? There's a parallel uh, uh, phenomenon, too, in wider Chinese society. If you look at um, how China has made leaps and bounds in telecommunications, they, in, in 1989, um, during the Tiananmen crisis, when people were organizing um, to get out on the streets, they did so through public telephones in shops and through fax machines. And then along comes mobile phones and China <clears throat> adopts the most advanced systems available. So, so it's uh, part of this is just the nature of um, how modern society, modern technology rather has, um, has evolved both in industrialized societies, ones that are already industrialized, and in, in ones that uh, that lacked that base. Now that I've gestured towards China's digital sophistication, I want to walk it back slightly uh, because China's digital authoritarianism has become this sexy topic, at least in the West, over the last several years. And in the book, something that stood out is this argument you make that Chinese intelligence services are so effective because of how they mix traditional intelligence practices with those digital tools. Can you talk a bit more about that? I think the way that I would frame it is that they've, they've seen what these tools can do and therefore they've, they've made those investments and they've created the relationships inside the MSS and outside the MSS. Um, you know, before the show, we were talking a little bit about Zach Dorfman's foreign policy articles. And I think he did a really fantastic job of pointing out the relationships between the Ministry of State Security and the big tech giants in China and how the MSS just decided, well, we're not going to invest in the processing power ourselves. You know, why do that when these companies have much better compute power than we do and can handle this data well? And I think just to think of one of the examples where they, they became effective is that in the past, they worked against targets from the outside in. So they'd look for the retirees and they, they would go meet them, right? Because if you're a retired intelligence official, for example, you're not subject to the same background checks, the same routine security screening that someone who is inside would have. And if you don't have a, a solid baseline, 
right? You, you want to talk to someone where you can sit down and talk and not be worried about operational security or that they're subject to scrutiny that you can't see. So you, you go and target the retirees, you build up a dossier and a network around all of the individuals and, and the people around the target, you know, who's who on the inside, uh, are there Chinese, are there people of Chinese ethnicity on the inside who might have family that we can leverage, right? To, to, they wanted to map the network both in and out. Digital tools, you know, particularly computer network exploitation, allowed them to do this on a mass scale and to target databases in Taiwan, like the district databases that will provide a lot of details about who individuals are, who their family members are. And when you have government apartment complexes, right, there's a good chance that if you're pulling out some of this data, you can basically identify, oh, here's everyone who works for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, or most of them, at least that are living in Taipei. Here's their family. Here's how they're connected. On the U.S. side, going after the Office of Personnel Management, right? They've got all the personnel, they've got all the personnel details of U.S. government employees. They then went after health insurance, they went after United, they went after Marriott, um, they went after, um, what was it, Experian. And you think about all of that data, you're now able to have a, a, a better dossier and a better sense of who everyone is. And then when you start turning that over to the big tech companies to churn, you've got targeting data, you've got tracking data, you're able to, to pick up whether or not someone is, you know, whether it, say, Maybe someone that you've identified as being CIA or another U.S. intelligence official is traveling to countries where you've got good access, and you, you've got a remarkable capacity to target, to queue, and otherwise enable sort of traditional human operations or counterintelligence to disrupt you know, what the United States or other countries are doing abroad. Beyond that, they also, I think, are gaining a much better appreciation of American society and uh, its economy. Although I'm waiting for the day, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to hold my breath, but I'm waiting for the day when they finally realize that the New York Times is not controlled by one of the political parties. What are some of the most common or consequential misconception, misconceptions about China's intelligence services? I think the biggest misconception is the conf that is sometimes made is to conflate information and intelligence and to just sort of say, well, in the Chinese, in Chinese, they don't distinguish between these two, these two concepts. And I think when you look through, whether it's the information science, informatics literature in China, whether you're looking through PLA publications, um, when you're, whether you're looking through some of the intelligence histories that have been sponsored by the Ministry of State Security, right? these are, it's pretty clear that they distinguish between information and intelligence. Now, they might have a broader net about what they're willing to pull in and consider to be useful, useful information, but they also don't make the mistake of saying, well, just because we pulled it in and we're an intelligence service, this makes it intelligence. Right. Intelligence in the Chinese system is, is most often described as a variation on, on, a, on a Chinese scientist, Qian Shui Sun, in the, who is kind of the, the father of the rocket program. He, he described intelligence as information to resolve a specific decision-making problem. Right, That's a very focused definition that's not just about you know, does this inform, does this increase awareness, right? It's about information being packaged very directly for action. You know, if this is the way that we're making our decisions, this is diagnostic and will determine that it's situation A or situation B and therefore what kind of response we need. Now, not all Chinese intelligence operations demonstrate that kind of focus, um, but it's worth keeping in mind that they're not just wasting time on targets. And, you know, in some cases, the focus on ethnic Chinese as potential sources, right, generally reflects the target that they're going after, right? Either because this is part of the network that they've mapped 
or it's because they're targeting overseas Chinese groups, or they're trying to get into dissident circles, right? If you want to be in those circles, you don't target, you know, you don't target a Hispanic or a white American to be a part of those circles. If you're looking to be, if you're looking to recruit a source inside the Russian government, you know, you, you don't spend time looking for the, you know, the Cossacks and the, and the Ukrainians inside that system. You're looking for the Russians who are part of the families that are, that make up the trusted infrastructure. So, and I, if we just sort of say, oh, well, information and intelligence are, are treated the same, we miss the targeted nature of their work and what might be motivating them to go after particular sources. And if, and if we're not looking at those things, then we end up sort of saying, oh, well, Chinese intelligence is everywhere. And we're kind of, for lack of a better way, we're kind of engaging in analytic nihilism um, because we don't want to deal f- firmly and solidly with what is it that Chinese intelligence is doing? Why are they doing it? And how do they intend to achieve their objectives? Peter, do you think part of the problem there is that uh, if you open up a dictionary, Qing Bao can be either information or intelligence? Yeah, but I don't know. I've always felt like when I when I see Qing Bao used in context, that there's always some element of something happening, of information being in motion, of a decision being made, right? In a way that, you know, information would not, like, like Xin Qi would not convey quite the same things. I want to take us back historically a little bit. As we've alluded to several times in this conversation, China's intelligence services are forged, or modern intelligence services at least, are forged um, in the fires of this huge civil conflict. How has an intelligence community shaped by... Um, an internal conflict and presumptively internal collection priorities adjusted to life as a global superpower with interests spreading far beyond um, what is happening internally. Part of the problem is something um, I mentioned earlier that <clears throat> there is a belief that society is full of enemies. Uh, that's a legacy of the revolution and of the purges under um, Mao Zedong that occurred during his uh, his life ending in 1976. And I think part of it too is that even if you go back before the time of the Communist Party um, into the early 1900s, um, I don't know if it indicates a wider uh, mission, but Sun Yat-sen, the father of modern China, was uh, in London, and he visited the Chinese embassy in London, and he was kidnapped um, because he was viewed as an enemy that needed to be dealt with. And so this issue of people overseas, overseas Chinese um, uh acting in ways that are contrary to the interests of the state um, and they need to be controlled and they need to be controlled by using their families back in China uh, is an old one. It's really, uh, I think, as old as that period at least. And so this this problem of not trusting one's own society that, that uh, stems from uh, dynastic times and continues under the communists um, with the Leninist system, where the the uh, the elite, the Leninist elite, are the ones who are in charge. They're the ones who make the policy. They're the ones who make the decisions for society. Uh, and we want to know what society thinks, but we don't want society changing who's in power. Certainly, through any sort of uh, election system or anything like that. Uh, this this is a continuing issue that uh, that. Uh, may not be solved in, in China in the near future. And indeed, um, just like Russia looks at Ukraine as a um, dangerous model of, of uh, reformed democracy that overcame most of the, um, maybe some of the corruption that existed in the Ukrainian system, 
uh, as as an alternative to Russian uh, rule under uh, Mr. Putin, uh, certainly the Chinese communists look at Taiwan. They see a democratic system that went through some rough edges, but eventually um, refined itself to its present state. And it's a dangerous, uh, dangerous example. I think the adjustment to life as a global superpower has been a little bit, a little bit rough around the edges for the, particularly for the ministry of state security, right? I think for military intelligence, it's a little more straightforward, right? We need to build satellites. We need defense attaches. We need certain kinds of information to draw in. And so their adoption to the modern world, certainly after reform and opening in 1979, was something that they could adjust to more naturally within their own within their own system. But the way the Ministry of State Security was created was in essence to do away with some of the personalization of the, the intelligence apparatus under the party and to bureaucratize it. And if you don't trust your own people, as as Matt was saying, you know, how do you bureaucratize an intelligence apparatus that can operate overseas? Right. Beyond your vision, beyond your beyond your control. You know, how how many people do you trust that, to push abroad for long periods of time without coming back to the PRC? Um, what kind of control mechanisms do you have? So I think for the Ministry of State Security, it was a, it was a tougher journey, um, not only for those reasons, but also because large chunks of the Ministry of State Security from 1983 through the 1990s were basically taken from the Ministry of Public Security and told the next day that, you know, your function in at the central level or at the provincial level or at this local level has been taken over by state security. So today you're no longer an officer of the Public Security Bureau. You're now working for the local state security bureau in your area. So if you've got a bunch of police, you're not necessarily looking, you're not necessarily in possession of a lot of the people that would look outward and would be effective intelligence officers and recruiting, recruiting foreigners. And I think this is one of the reasons why the ministry of state security instigated a historical, a series of historical studies and, and writings, which Matt and I certainly benefited from in writing this book, but they wanted to make sure that they told the stories of their people so that they could say, look, you, you're an intelligence officer in the Ministry of State Security. This is our legacy. You're, you're standing on the shoulders of people like Hu Di, Li Kunong, Wu Xiaochen, and a number of others who were sort of objectively good and didn't have the historical baggage of a Kong Sheng. Um, and I think this is where they've, they've had the most trouble. How do you build out a foreign intelligence capacity when you're out in the world in the way that that Chinese individuals, companies, and government now is, you know, sufficient to inform those 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 interests that are being created by that global presence. And so, they've when you look through our when you look through our book of cases, right, you see that all I think almost every single one of their cases was recruited inside the PRC, you know, people who were going back and forth. And that's really good if you want to know about U.S.-China relations, but it's probably a terrible way to understand how the U.S. deals with Russia or how the U.S. deals with the Middle East, right? Because those individuals, the people who would be knowledgeable about that, are not the ones who are going to be going back and forth and sort of as a routine bridge between, between the People's Republic of China and the United States. And I think this is probably one of the other things that drove that growth of of computer network exploitation within the Ministry of State Security. If the way that you're recruiting human sources doesn't help you get into insight into problems that you now have, here's kind of a turnkey solution that is going to give you a lot of data that's better than just reading the newspaper about what else might be taking place. For the last several years, I don't know exactly when, there's been this sense in the United States that China is winning the intelligence war, stealing our data, our IP, et cetera. Do the Chinese see this the same way? 
I, I wish we knew the answer to that, but when you, I would say though, if you go back to 2012 and 2013, the power transition from Hu Jintao to Xi Jinping, there's a very clear point in certainly in 2012 ahead of the, ahead of the party Congress where Hu Jintao and Xi Jinping are very clearly standing together on a couple of issues. And it's the launching of an anti-corruption campaign and reforming the security apparatus. And assuming that what the New York Times story in 2017 said about U.S. intelligence operations inside China, that is true, that people, that the United States was exploiting this corruption to pay promotion fees for its agents within the Chinese government, you can see very clearly how there was in fact a nexus between, at least in the party's mind, there was a nexus between external threats and internal and internal problems and that they had to deal with that. When you add Bo Xi Lai and you know, the attempted defection of his, of his police chief, Wang Lijun, and some of the corruption that Bo Xi Lai was believed to be involved in. To the American in, embassy, right? To the American consulate in Chengdu. Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah. And Bo Xi Lai is competing for leadership. He's challenging Hu Jintao. He's challenging Xi Jinping. And he's also corrupting elements of inside the system. I mean, one of the things that's been reported in, some, in overseas Chinese media about Bo Xi Lai was that he had gotten access to the red phone system, the secure phone system um, that's used by the, by the leadership in the PRC, and that he'd been trying to corrupt part of the State Secrets Bureau, um, the Baomiju, as a way to get access to internal communications and classification. Now, to the best of anyone's knowledge, and no one's written about a connection between Bo Xi Lai and, and foreign intelligence, but if you're looking if you're the Ministry of State Security, if you're Xi Jinping and Hu Jintao looking at Neil Haywood, um, the British national who was murdered, um, at least in connection with, with Bo Xi Lai's wife, right? you're looking at this confluence of internal and external threat that could be incredibly dangerous to the system and reaching up, you know, at least if it involved Bo Xi Lai, up into the Politburo and maybe even the standing committee ranks. So I would guess that when they started seeing this and understanding what, again, if what the New York Times reported is true, if this is what they were seeing, I would imagine that this created a quite, quite a bit of panic within their system. And the, the strength of which the anti-corruption campaign went after certain activities, you know, the pay for promotion type type features in, in parts of the PLA in other parts of the system. I think it's safe to say that it's not been, at least from their side, a, a one-sided fight. Yeah. One, um, one bit of record I'd like to be able to view is, uh, at the Harvard university admissions office was Xi Jinping's daughter being paid for by him or were there special scholarships? How did he get the money to send his daughter to Harvard? Interesting question. Uh, the anti-corruption campaign seems to have targeted Xi's enemies rather than his uh, his allies. And indeed, corruption going back to the '90s was uh, extremely and before was an extremely serious problem, um, particularly once Jiang Zemin sort of unleashed um, the bureaucracy and allowed them to establish companies to uh, to uh, uh, add to their to their budgets, but of course this ended up being uh, uh, fat cats licking the cream off the top, as it were, uh, and huge amounts of money being uh, siphoned elsewhere. Uh, even today, huge amounts of money being siphoned overseas to buy property, etc. Uh, so this problem of corruption um, is. One problem that I think the the uh, system people in the system look at and see uh, that they need to reform very seriously before they can be winning any sort of intelligence war. Um, on the other hand, um, they certainly have done well at stealing IP, stealing data, 
um, a lot of uh, a lot of private companies have only recently awakened to this problem of how to uh, to arm themselves better, both in the digital realm and internally against uh, the so-called insider threat that occasionally arises in in uh, U.S. companies um, properly organizing their data uh, and so on. Uh, in that sense, um, uh, in in some in some theaters, certainly the Chinese side is doing better than we'd like them to do. In others, however, uh, they are they seem to be engaged in in uh, reforms that they hope will improve their performance. Peter, Matt, this has been a fantastic conversation, but we're running short on time. So I'm going to give you guys one final question. The book was published in November of 2019. Um, the world has changed a lot since then. U.S.-China relations have changed a lot since then. If there was one or two things you would add to the book um, in light of what's transpired over the last, uh, I guess, almost three years, uh, what would that be? I'm not sure that there's big things that we would, or at least that I think would need to be included. I wouldn't mind the opportunity to update it with all of the additional cases and convictions that have come through. Um, because a number of these cases, I think, are, are quite good at illustrating the way in which, in particular, the Ministry of State Security operates and how far they've come from what at times was incredibly clumsy in the 1980s and 1990s into something that is a, a much more sophisticated intelligence service. You know, I, I remember talking with some of my former colleagues about it and the Ministry of State Security in particular was considered a, a threat because of the scope, scale, and potential impact of their operations, right? You know, if we ended up in a war with China over Taiwan or, you know, in terms of a, a global economic competition, right, the impact of what the Ministry of State Security does could be quite substantial or is quite substantial. But it's only been recently that they've added operational sophistication at a, in, a, in a classic sense, um, you know, better at handling sources, recruiting higher level sources, and being operationally creative in, in unexpected ways. And so it'd, it'd, be nice to, it'd be nice to be able to update it with all of the additional cases that have come through. Yeah, it'd be nice to be able to update it with um, some leaked documents from Beijing too. Um, they've one thing I'll say about the Chinese services: they've been very good at secrecy, just in general. Um, no officials writing memoirs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, at least, uh, at least ones that are that are not officially curated. Um, so, Beijing, if you're listening. We're waiting for those leaks. Come on, get on the stick. Um, and I'll mention too that uh, that this book is coming out in paperback in August. Our book. Fantastic. Well, Peter, Matt, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, I'll put a note for our listeners about the uh, paperback edition, so they can uh, take a look at that and pre-order it. Uh, that also the. Uh, hardcover is currently available and also in digital form, if I'm not mistaken. So thank you guys and signing off.